السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته To carry on with the surgical anatomy lectures I'm gonna cover in this presentation the clinical impact of pituitary anatomy I'm Dr. Dalia Saleh, professor and the head of anatomy department at Mansoura University, Egypt The objectives of my presentation are First, I'm gonna talk about the development and anomalies of the pituitary gland its relations and finally its blood supply As we know that the pituitary gland is ectodermal in origin, but it develops from two different sources. In order to understand the development of the pituitary gland, we should revise these pictures first. This is the surface ectoderm, and this dark area represents the most anterior median region of the surface ectoderm. We can call it the anterior neural ridge. Here we can see the developing neural tube, which is also ectodermal in origin. In the middle, we have the notochord rostral to it lies the precordial plate, and inside the embryo here is the developing gut. With development of the neural tube and formation of the head fold due to expansion of the brain, the anterior neural ridge region will travel ventrally, and this area will form the lower face region or the oral area. With further development and with the regression of the precordial plate and the migration of the neural crest cells, the anterior neural ridge region which now forms the roof of the mouth comes in close contact with the floor of the diencephalon. This close proximity triggers the development of the pituitary gland. Any disruption of this will lead to various types of anomalies. So, the pituitary gland has a dual origin. First, the rathkis pouch, which is an upward growth from the epithelial lining of the roof of the mouth. The other source is the infundibulum, which is a downward growth from the floor of the diencephalon of the developing brain. Later on, a rathkis pouch forms a vesicle and detaches from the roof of the mouth. The cells in its anterior wall proliferates extensively to form the anterior lobe of the pituitary gland, while the cells at its posterior wall proliferate more slowly to form the intermediate lobe of the pituitary gland. So Rathke's pouch will eventually give us the adenohypothesis and differentiates into pars distalis, pars tuberalis, which wrap around the infundibular stem, and together they will form the pituitary stalk. The pars intermedia, which remains narrow and becomes rudimentary in human, and is separated from the anterior loop or pars distalis by the pituitary cleft. While the infundibulum will give us the neurohypothesis or the posterior loop of the pituitary gland, which remains connected to the undersurface of the brain by the infundibular stem. Inside it lies the infundibular recess of the third ventricle. In the same time, there is cell proliferation and differentiation. We start with the pituitary stem cells or the progenitors, which undergo extensive proliferation, and then they exit the proliferation and form committed precursors. They are non-cycling, they undergo differentiation and give us the fetal pituitary cells and finally the adult pituitary cells. Eventually, in the adenohypothesis, we have five types of hormone-secreting cells. The somatotropes, which uh, represent about 50% of the total number of the pituitary cells, they lie at the lateral region of the pituitary gland, and they will secrete the growth hormone. We have the lactotrophs, about 15% of the total number of the pituitary cells. They lie in, at the posteromedial and posterolateral aspects of the pituitary gland, and they will secrete the prolactin hormone. The corticotrophs, again about 15% of the total number of the cells, and they lie at the median region of the pituitary gland, and they will secrete many types of hormones like ACTH. The gonadotrophs, about 10% of the total number of the cells, they mainly lie at uh, pars tuberalis and they will secrete FSH and LH. Finally, we have the thyrotrophs. They are about 5% of the total number of the cells in the anterior pituitary. 
and they lie at the most anterior region of the pituitary gland and they will secrete TSH. The neurohypophysis or the posterior lobe of the pituitary gland is connected to the hypothalamus through the hypothalamohypophysial tract. The cells there do not secrete hormones, they only store the hormones secreted by the paraventricular and the supraoptic nuclei of the hypothalamus, which secrete ADH and oxytocin. For the anomalies of the pituitary gland, we could end up with a genesis, which is incompatible with life, or hypogenesis, which will lead to panhypopituitarism. We may also have duplication of the pituitary gland, which results from early malformation at the craniofacial region, and this is a very rare anomaly. We could also have craniopharyngioma, which is a, a number of tumors that present in the cella thoracica from the remnants of the rascus pouch. We also could have ectopic posterior pituitary gland, which appears here in the MRI as pride spot. Here we can see it at the region of the median eminence away from the cella thoracica. And finally, we could have what's called pharyngeal hypothesis which results from lack of detachment of the pituitary gland from the roof of the mouth. The pituitary gland is a small endocrine gland that is attached to the undersurface of the brain by an infundibulum. It lies within a depression on the body of the sphenoid bone, it is called the cella thoracica. This depression or hypophysial fossa is limited anteriorly by the tuberculum cerny and posteriorly by dorsum cerny and is separated from the sphenoid sinus by a thin plate of bone. If you want to look at it from the top view, we will remove the scalp, the skull cap and now we can see the middle cranial fossa in the middle we have the body of the sphenoid and if we enlarge it, this is the hypophysial fossa it is related anteriorly to the tuberculum cellae, which is limited laterally by the middle and anterior clinoid processes. Posteriorly, it is related to the dorsum cellae, which is limited laterally by the posterior clinoid processes. Stretched between the anterior and the posterior clinoid processes, we have the diaphragma cella, which is a fold of dura matter that helps to keep the weight of the brain and the CSF away from the pituitary gland. It has a circular opening in the middle to allow the passage of the pituitary stalk. On each side of the cell thoracica, we have the following relations. We have the cavernous sinus, which drains posteriorly into the superior and the inferior pituitary sinuses. We have the internal carotid artery, which first passes within the cavernous sinus and then make a siphon and pass above it. And then we have the following cranial nerves. Most medially we have the optic nerve that exits the orbit through the optic canal. Then we have the three nerves that move the eye, the oculomotor, the trochlear and the abducens nerve. And this large uh, nerve is the trigeminal nerve which will divide into three divisions, the ophthalmic, maxillary and mandibular divisions. So posteriorly, the pituitary gland is related to the dorsum cellae, which separates it from the basilar artery and the bones. Laterally, we have the cavernous sinus with its contents. So in its lateral wall passes oculomotor, trochlear, ophthalmic, and maxillary divisions of the trigeminal nerve. Medially, we have the abducens nerve, and most medially, the cavernous part of the internal carotid artery. Superiorly, we have the diaphragma cell and the optic chiasma, and inferiorly, the pituitary gland is separated from the body of the sphenoid and the sphenoid air sinuses by thin plates of bone. Finally, with the blood supply of the pituitary gland, it is supplied by a single hypophysial artery which arises from the cavernous part of the internal carotid artery and from many superior hypophysial arteries which arise from the supraclinoid part of the internal carotid artery. The inferior hypophysial artery will supply the posterior loop and the lower part of the pituitary stalk, while the superior hypophysial arteries 
will supply the hypothalamus, the median eminence, and the upper part of the pituitary stalk. For more details here, we can see the superior hypophyseal arteries, which give twigs to supply the hypothalamus and the median eminence, and also give branches that wrap around the upper part of the pituitary stalk. These arteries will penetrate the pituitary stalk and break into primary capillary plexus. This plexus will be drained by the long portal vein which travels downward along the pituitary stalk and break into the anterior lobe of the pituitary gland into another capillary plexus. It is called the secondary capillary plexus. It also gives an important branch called the artery of the trapecula, which travels downward, penetrates the anterior lobe, and does not give glandular branches, and it travels within the trapecula of the pituitary gland till it reaches the lower part of the pituitary stalk. From there, it gives ascending stalk branches, and in the same time, it will communicate with the inferior hypophyseal artery itself or its branches. The inferior hypophyseal artery gives many branches that will supply the capsule and the posterior loop of the pituitary gland and also communicate with the artery of the trapecula and also gives stalk branches to the lower part of the pituitary stalk. Eventually, the hypophyseal veins exit the pituitary gland and drain into the cavernous sinus. This is the end of my presentation. Thanks for listening. If you like it, please do not forget to subscribe, like, and share. And do not forget to hit the notification bell so you can know if I upload another video.